We look, we buy. It is ours. Ours to consume, to sell again, perhaps to give away. More often, ours to keep. Six pounds for the egg. Uh, uh, you can have that for two pounds. What are these cute little tongs? Where did you go? Tea. Tea, Kelly. We look, we buy, and we collect valuable objects, but the most valuable object of all has become the oil painting. Oil paintings often depict things, things which in reality are buyable. To paint a thing and put it on a canvas, is not unlike buying it and putting it in your house. The objects within the painting often appear as tangible as those outside it. If you buy a painting, you buy also the look of the thing it represents. And this one? There's 17 pounds. Isn't this silver? No, dear, silver plate. The mother for hands. Paintings often show treasures. But paintings have become treasures themselves. Art galleries are like palaces, but they are also like banks. When they shut for the night, they are guarded, lest the images of the things which are desirable are stolen. The value of paintings has become mysterious. Where, we ask ourselves, does this value come from? Those who write about art or talk or teach about it often raise art above life, turning it into a kind of religion. In the first of these programs, I tried to show how and why modern methods of reproduction and communication, like colour photography, like television, have theoretically changed the meaning of the visual art of the past, demystifying it and making it secular. But mostly those who use these new methods of reproduction and communication, those who write books or make television programs about art, tend to cling to the old approach. Art remains something sacred. A love of art seems automatically to be offered as a sublime human experience. Perhaps, though, we should consider this historical record. Two films of two concerts given in Britain and Germany during the last war. Both films made as war propaganda to engender pride in the national cultural heritage. The first shows a concert in London given by Mara Hess. The second shows a concert in Berlin by Furtwängler.
the experience of art is sublime, it looks as though it can be sublimely independent of a lot of other values. So perhaps we should be somewhat wary of a love of art. You cannot explain anything in history, not even in art history, by a love of art. Let us look at a painting whose subject is an art lover. This picture, which shows a 17th century patron surrounded by his collection, tells us more about Europe and painting from the Renaissance onwards than hundreds of art books or essays on aesthetics. What does it show? The sort of man for whom painters painted their paintings. What are these paintings? Before they are anything else, they are objects which can be bought and owned. Unique objects. A patron cannot be surrounded by music or poems in the same way as he is surrounded by his pictures. Does this special ownership of pictures engender a special kind of pride? It is as though he lives in a house built of paintings. What is their advantage over walls of stone or wood? They show him sights. There are many different subjects. But what the pictures all have in common is that they are painted with oil paint. From about 1500 to 1900, the visual arts of Europe were dominated by the oil painting, the easel picture. This kind of painting had never been used anywhere else in the world before. The tradition of oil painting was made up of hundreds of thousands of unremarkable works, hung all over the walls of galleries and private houses, rather in the same way as the reserve collection is still hung in the National Gallery. If, as we are normally taught to do, we emphasize the genius of the few and concentrate only on the exceptional works, we will misunderstand what the tradition was really about. European oil painting, unlike the art of other civilizations and periods, placed a unique emphasis on the tangibility, the solidity, the texture, the weight, the graspability of what was depicted. What was real was what you could put your hands on. The idea that a thing is only real if you can pick it up may be connected with the idea of taking a thing to pieces to see how it works. At the beginning of the tradition of oil painting, the emphasis on the real being solid was part of a scientific attitude. But the emphasis on the real being solid, on being what you could put your hands on, became e equally closely connected with a sense of ownership. These scientific instruments were used for navigation. They were painted at the time when the world trade routes to Europe were being opened up by the heroic voyages which we learnt about in school, bringing European civilization to the rest of the world. It tends to be forgotten that these voyages were the start of the European slave trade and the traffic which began to siphon the riches of the rest of the world into Europe. Christopher Columbus wrote from Jamaica, gold is a wonderful thing. By means of gold, one can even get souls into paradise. In 1519, Magellan set out to sail round the world. He and an astronomer friend with whom he had planned the voyage were to keep 20% of the profits made and the right to run the government of any land they discovered and conquered. This globe charts Magellan's voyage round the world. Beside it is a book of arithmetic, a hymn book, and a lute. To conquer a land, it was always necessary to convert it to Christianity. The picture was painted in 1533 by Holbein. It shows two French diplomats in London. The picture is about science, about navigation, about diplomacy, about power. But in the way that it has been painted, in the way that it has been seen. What is it most about? There is not a surface in this picture which does not denote wealth. There is not a surface which has not been elaborately and skillfully worked. Except for their faces and hands, Every square inch of the canvas has been gone over numerous times by weavers, embroiderers, 
carpet makers, mosaic makers, leather workers, furriers, jewelers, and last of all, by Holbein the painter. They are two men convinced that the world is there to furnish their residence in it. The seafaring instruments have been placed on an eastern carpet. Without the first, the second would not be there. Implicit in the rise of European Christian culture was the destruction of other cultures. But the Europeans saw it differently. They believed that their civilization was in all respects more advanced than any other. The African kneels to hold up an oil painting to his master. The painting he is holding depicts the castle above one of the principal centers of the West African slave trade. Many works of art in other cultures and periods have celebrated wealth and power. Gods, princes and dynasties were worshipped. But these works were static, ritualistic, hierarchic, symbolic. They celebrated a social or divine order. The European oil painting served a different kind of wealth. It glorified not a static order of things, but the ability to buy and furnish and to own. Before the invention of oil painting, medieval European painters often used gold leaf in their pictures. Afterwards, gold disappeared from their paintings and was only used for their frames. But sometimes the paintings themselves were simple demonstrations of what gold, of what money, could buy. A certain kind of oil painting celebrated merchandise in a way that had never happened before in the history of art. Merchandise became the actual principal subject of these works. Eating is a pleasure, but these paintings cannot be eaten. They are a demonstration of something else. First of all, of the artist's virtuosity. Secondly, of the owner's wealth. Livestock. Not animals in their natural condition, but animals whose pedigree is emphasized and whose pedigree is a proof of their value, whose pedigree emphasizes the social pedigree of their owners. They are painted like pieces of furniture, a table or a chair with four legs. Objects. Objects which, significantly enough, became known as objets d'art. Houses. Buildings not considered as ideal works of architecture, as in the work of some of the earlier Renaissance artists, but buildings considered as landed property. Portraits were equally important. Portraits of the owners, the owners of the paintings, and the owners of much else besides. These paintings did not directly celebrate what was buyable. They were records of the confidence of those to whom ownership brought confidence. Those who could buy banquets, horses, bulls, houses, hung on their walls generations of portraits painted to celebrate a continuity of power and worthiness. There were hundreds of thousands of such portraits, but those they depicted represented an exceedingly small fraction of the population. The poor have neither annals nor portraits. Their lives are unrecorded. But again, the style with which the average portrait was painted reveals something about the basis of this confidence and of this so-called dignity of the sitter. They were painted as though they were a strange mixture of livestock, furniture, and tailor's dummies. Every portrait is a record which says, I once existed and looked like this. These portraits say, in addition, 
I was an object of respect and envy. I had only to raise my hand to receive attention. Everybody's clothes indicate social status. But the clothes and feathers and jewellery of these women make exaggerated claims. It is their clothes, not their faces, which dazzle. The faces of women in many European paintings are like the faces of swimmers in seas of silk and satin. Oil painting could paint these materials as they had never before been painted. There were also paintings whose subjects were taken from classical literature, subjects which today seem quite remote, unsubstantial, dreamlike. But this wasn't so when the pictures were bought. Classical mythology was part of the specialized knowledge of the privileged minority. And these paintings helped them to visualize themselves whilst displaying the classic virtues, making the classic gestures. The paintings were the settings for charades in which they themselves would play. The props were given, the spirit of the performance was left to the owner's imagination. The figures were like garments held out for the spectator owners to put their arms into and wear. Here, the daughters of the family dress up as graces, decorating hymen. But the dressing up didn't have to be as literal as that. The spectator wore the clothes and played his part, just in imagination. Who would you guess she was meant to represent? Different painters see her differently. But do these paintings have anything in common? And if so, what is it that they all convey? These pictures are all from the National Gallery and are all of Mary Magdalene. The point of the original story is that a prostitute so loves Christ that she repents of her past and comes to accept the mortality of flesh and the immortality of the soul. In each case, the way the picture is painted contradicts the essence of the story. The method of painting, the way of seeing, can only envisage her as being, before everything else, takeable. The hypocrisy is sexual. The title suggests sacred love. The painting, with title as alibi, speaks of profane love. Alternatively, she is simply a well-dressed, eligible young woman. The tangibility of her wardrobe, the elegance of her presence is all. It's a portrait that might have been painted of her for her future husband on the occasion of their betrothal. What I'm saying applies least of all to landscape painting or to the great late masters of landscape painting like Constable or Turner or Monet. But even there in the development of landscape painting, the faculty of oil painting to celebrate property did play a certain role. This is what Sir Kenneth Clarke says about Gainsborough. At the very beginning of his career, his pleasure in what he saw inspired him to put into his pictures backgrounds as sensitively observed as the cornfield in which are seated Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. This enchanting work is painted with such love and mastery that we should have expected Gainsborough to go further in the same direction. But he gave up direct painting and evolved the melodious style of picture making by which he is best known. Now look at it another way. The way I would use it for my argument. They have become not a couple in nature, as Rousseau imagined nature. Theirs is private land. Look at their attitude towards it. The attitude is visible. If a man stole a potato at that time, he risked a public whipping. The sentence for poaching was deportation. 
Without a doubt, among the principal pleasures this painting gave to Mr. and Mrs. Andrews was the pleasure of seeing themselves as the owners of their own land. And this pleasure was enhanced by the ability of oil paint to render this land in all its substantiality. The surrealist painter, Magritte, commented on this faculty of oil painting. The painted landscape stands in for the real one. A number of great painters used oil paint to express their own highly personal and exceptional visions. They, in many ways, contradict my argument. They also contradict the tradition from which they sprang. This picture by Rubens celebrates the park and farmland surrounding the chateau he lived in. But the chateau and its owners are far away. Hunting is free. The fields are golden. The landscape is like a counterpane on a bed. It is a painting which goes beyond its traditional category. It is not a painting about a castle and its lands. On the contrary, it shows a world without scarcity, a world of plenty, a world, that is, which contradicts the entire history of private property. There's a painting of a woman by Vermeer, which at first sight confirms everything I have said. It would seem to be the ideal illustration of my argument. She is weighing gold in a pair of scales, or perhaps also weighing the pearls strewn on the table. Her interest is commercial. In the way the scene is painted, the substantiality and tangibility of everything is emphasized. Everything suggests the solidity of a Dutch middle-class home, even the painting of the Last Judgment on the wall behind her. A painting on the wall is a mark of prosperity. But go on looking. Gradually, the painting becomes more mysterious, less easily explainable in my terms. The light falls on her face, on her fingers, on the scales, on the pearls. The moment has been preserved. And as we realize that, the way that it has been preserved, we realize that like every moment, it was unrepeatable. It is as though she is holding the moment between her forefinger and thumb on the scales of the past and the future. Despite its apparent celebration of property, this painting is about the mystery of light and time as we look up at the stars. Not for one moment would I deny or belittle the significance and achievement of paintings like these. But we should not confuse these exceptional paintings and everything in the museums, everything said by art experts, encourages this confusion. We should not confuse such exceptional works with the purpose and significance of the general tradition. Let me show the difference again, this time at the highest level. Two self-portraits by Rembrandt. One when he was young, one when he was old. But the difference between them isn't just a question of how age changes a man's character. In the first painting, Rembrandt used the style and methods of the tradition for their traditional purposes, as an advertisement for the owner's good fortune, prestige, and wealth. In the later painting, he has turned the tradition against itself. All has gone, except a sense of the question of existence, of existence as a question. Intermittently, the tradition can breed within itself a counter-tradition. But the basic values of the tradition win in the end. This painting now has a fabulous price on its head, perhaps three million pounds. It has itself become a fabulous object of property. 
Of course, a lot more can be said about European oil painting than I have said. Yet what I have tried to show is a fundamental part of the truth which is usually ignored. We study other cultures far away as anthropology. That's to say, we study them from the outside. We don't judge them purely according to their own explanations of themselves. Now, if we look at the culture of the European oil painting in the same spirit, leaving aside its own claims for itself, I believe we will find that oil painting was, before everything else, a medium which celebrated private possessions. The tradition of the oil painting has now been broken once and for all. In some ways, publicity has taken its place. The sight of it makes us want to possess it. And publicity is the subject of our program next week. And the final part of Ways of Seeing is right here on BBC4 tomorrow at half past seven. Next tonight, stay with us as we prowl through wild China.